Once again, Julia Taliesin. Ta-da! Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for whoever has stayed. That's awesome. Um, so as we just have two candidates for mayor, um, they're going to get a little bit longer to answer these questions, so you'll have three minutes each. Um, we do have a timekeeper. I will also keep you honest, but when you see Greta's very angry face, um, that means you have about 10 seconds left, and then we'll wrap it, wrap it up. Um, so I'll start off with our first question. Um, Marianne, would you like to go first? Amazing. Okay. Um, so the first question is, Somerville's goal to be carbon neutral by 2050 is admirable, but we are not currently on track to achieve it. So how do you intend to accelerate the city's efforts so we can move from aspiration to actual results? And you'll have three minutes, so dive in. So part of how I see we could move forward and move faster on our goal is to start with solar energy. And I think that part of what we need to do is be leaders as local government in our school buildings and city hall. We want our landlords to move to solar energy or other so energy forms, then we need to be leaders in that. Also, I also think we need to be inclusive of businesses and offices. So part of one of the things that I've worked on in my own workspace is we've done recycling. You'd be surprised at how many companies don't do recycling or have any energy programs. So part of what we've been doing is working situations where we can have recycling um, or any pro programs, making sure people shut their computers, their lights off. Also, we need to be more inclusive. So I've begun conversations with Reverend Walker, who has been doing some work in how to reach out to lower income and bilingual people on how to be more green in, in, in their income level. So I think that's where we need to start. Well, good afternoon. I'm Mayor Joe Curtatoni. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I want to thank you for your activism, uh, especially those who work collectively with the city to launch uh, some of our climate forward, which really outlines the framework over the next five to ten years of the steps that are actionable and implementable. Climate change is one, if not the greatest existential threat uh, we face. It is real. And locally, cities play an important role because City regions right now where 54% of the world's population live and by 2050, 75% uh, contribute more than 70% of the greenhouse, global greenhouse gas initiatives. So we need to be leaders locally. I'm proud that some of us, we set a bold goal to be carbon neutral by 2050 and I'm proud to lead the Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, 15 cities and Boston's in accord to set the same goal. Now the action, the work, the activism has to happen. So the steps are implemented and get us there and climate change is cumulative. Right? And we need to work now. We can't wait for a year 30 to take those steps because reversing or trying to retrofit buildings and take steps to reverse the consequences of it will be difficult and expensive in some cases and possible. What it's going to take to get there is activism. Uh, and what I want to talk about as we go through in this form is how we work collectively for that collective action to engage every stakeholder in the city to own the work to understand how we take on action to improve our carbon footprint and contributions to our emissions by buildings, our transportation systems, how we live, how we consume, and integrate that to every policy decision we make, every programmatic investment decision we make, and in, in every investment we decide upon. I look forward to this conversation. Thanks. Thank you. All right, awesome. Um, so next up, Mayor Critatoni will have you answer this question first. Um, so how does climate inform your top three policy priorities? Well, climate uh, change and climate action is inextricably linked to and should be with all our decision making. In particular, uh, if we think about what our greenhouse gas inventory and all our other assessments informed us of, is two, more than two-thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. Another third for transportation policy, or transportation, mostly vehicle chips, commercial, um, and, and singular passenger vehicles, and the rest from waste about 3%. three but everything we do in terms of thinking about how we create a more equitable, more multimodal community and providing those low carbon, equitable forms of transportation to people is tied to a, a what our impacts would be on climate action and achieving climate action and achieving carbon neutrality, as well as how we think of how we're going to grow and develop the community. This is important. Uh, as our city develops, we're only 4.1 square miles, what we want to avoid is uh, emissions lock. 
We need to think about our building policies and how our buildings being built. How do we achieve uh, buildings that are built be, that are carbon uh, neutral, really net, uh, produce a net zero energy that are self-sustaining, uh, and that's critical because if we allow that to hold and invest over the long term as a municipality, then it would be difficult because the consequences would be more severe and it would be more expensive, more difficult to deal with the consequences of those emissions. So everything we do as a community, planning our long-term transportation plans, and it's factored in right now as we think about how we uh, utilize um, uh, public realm, our sidewalks, our streets, for, to provide more equitable, uh, low-carbon forms of transportation, to our development plans, all our districts that are, that are growing, uh, places like the Inner Belt and Brick Bottom and Boynton Yards and the rest of Assembly, what type of um, open space and activity we can provide to people, how we can promote, not only incentivize, but work to change regulations to, to require uh, carbon neutral buildings to be built, that factors into all our decision making. It is inextricably tied. Thank you. All right, Marianne, you're up. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please. All right. So how does climate inform your top three policy priorities? Thank you. So for me, it's about in more of action and making sure that the policies include quick action in moving forward, such as a lot of the building trades have been moving to more energy efficient and environmentally friendly materials, so we need to engage them more. A lot of unions that are engaging in climate as part of their contract negotiations, and we need to be inclusive of them. We need to be inclusive of homeowners because we need to be careful because we want to include them, then we need to find a way to bring them in and hear from them how we can make this happen because we don't want want to, to force or cause them any more financial harm because then that's going to cause financial harm to renters. So we need to make sure that we bring people to the table to have that conversation and set goals for action, not just policy. We just need to set a deadline and say, by this date, this is what we're going to do. I also think that we need to have more open space. We've, this city used to be a lot of open spaces and growing up here, gardens were everywhere. People had gardens growing fresh vegetables, fruit, they would give them out to community members. We have taken every valuable space and made it into tar and cement. And I think that we need to go back to the community space of community gardens and providing fresh fruit and vegetables to our community members. We also need to look at other transportation alternatives for our seniors and lower income people to get to the farm stands. We're not doing enough to do that. And it's, if we're talking about their health and how it in the environment and how it impacts them, we also need to take a look at how we're not helping them to get to a better place. Thank you. All right, um, and our last question, Marianne, I'll have you answer this one first. Um, so what are your top three priorities in your climate action plan specifically, and how do you plan to work with the city council to get them done? So I would start with looking at also um, local jobs. We talk a lot about local jobs and about staggered commutes because I think if we're talking about transportation and how that the carbon affects our air, we also need to take a look at different solutions as far as how to set different work schedules, more work options at home, um, and I'd love to sit with the council and talk about how do we get more green space. I heard everybody here talk about more green space. But we also, and people talk about inclusion and bringing people in. We also need to think about the times and the way we schedule our meetings because we're not thinking about how, it's not a nine to five job anymore that anybody has and it certainly in most people in the city work more than one job. So we need to make sure that we're organizing ourselves and part of the policy would be to make sure that we're more flexible and we're going out to communities. Because not everybody can come to City Hall, not everybody has a computer, not everybody always has a phone on. So we need to make sure that we're bringing ourselves into the community and I would set policies and hopefully we'll, they would agree that we would be more outreach into the communities and make sure that language capabilities are there. And maybe 
think about alternative ways on how to educate people at their level of education. I don't think we, we take for granted that people these days have a high school education or a college education. We don't think about that. Some people aren't provided those opportunities. So I'd like to make sure any policies would also engage that. Thank you. I, there are three areas I would want to focus in, on the, with the city council. First, we know what the problem is uh, that is causing and exacerbating compounding climate change. We know what to do. We know what the steps we have to take. Are we going to do that collectively uh, from the executive, legislative, from the community as well? It takes collective action. It is an adaptive challenge that everyone has to own. The work is out to be done together. Working with the council, there are immediately these areas you need to work on. Not passing the zoning with the incentives in the zoning, uh, such as the green factor, to increase you know, more hardy vegetation in the city that can absorb and create the cooling effect for the city that we need in trees, providing the incentives to change our building infrastructure, the greatest emission, the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in some of all in cities around the world, but also to work with our council to join me in the advocacy I'm taking on as the chairperson of the Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, the 15 cities in town in the Metro Boston area. I was able to move that coalition to become, to, to clear the inner core to be carbon neutral by 2050. Now we need to advocate for major regulatory reform. We need, a, we need a stretch code that defines carbon neutrality for buildings and makes it happen. And by carbon neutrality, buildings that uh, are reducing energy use on site, utilizing clean energy resources on site, and then supplementing that from renewables from the grid. That's what we're talking about. That is critical. We can do that. We'll incentivize it to a point in our zoning, but we need to have that regulatory enforcement as well, as well as to engage industry leaders as to their knowledge. But I also want to continue to work with the council on what we're doing to think about our mobility, how we move. Uh, we can offer low cost, uh, low carbon, equitable mobility to our constituents. That means taking over the public realm as we evaluate uh, our parking policy policies and our investments and our priorities to make sure that we're not building and planning a city for cars. If we do that, that's what we'll get. And transportation is the other third one, the other the greatest emitters of greenhouse gases to our city. And the people who suffer the most of it are those who are not contributed to climate change but suffer the worst consequences, the most vulnerable, the poor, people in environmental justice zones, and they don't typically get the benefit from climate action. We need to make sure they do that, so I'm going to work with the council on that. And then the other change has to come collectively from the people in the community. So I'll be proposing to the council in the next budget that we have a summable climate forward team where we're building, investing, paying and cultivating a cohort of activists and advocates working for the city as ambassadors, working with every household, every individual in Somerville, because this is about adaptive change. We know what the technical solutions are. The question is, are we, not just as a city government, because we'll put our plans forward. We know where we have to put our priorities, but as a community and as a society, are we willing to adopt and fight for those changes? And that's how we should be doing here in Somerville. Thank you both very much. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to the audience for some questions. Does so anyone here would like to ask your mayoral candidate some climate-related questions? Yeah, thank you. So just please introduce yourself. Um, I'm Anna Callahan. I'm with Our Revolution Somerville, and uh, this question came up during the um, the City Council uh, forum, and it really is, we know that two-thirds of our carbon emissions come from housing, and in Somerville, we are about, you know, almost two-thirds landlord-owned houses. So how, what can the city do, um, and what can the mayor do, um, to move those people to, you know, upgrade their housing. Thank you. Mayor Curry, would you like to take this first? Uh, I'm sorry, was it Anne? Yeah. Oh, no, thank you for the, for the question. Um, well, there's a few things we can do. I don't think we should just rest and say where our hands are tied. Although, you know, we don't get to control directly the building code in our communities. A lot of things are working on collectively as a community and with the council in our zoning code to incentivize a movement towards households that are greener or more carbon neutral. But again, I go back to what I said. This is where we need to lead uh, as, 
as elected officials, public officials, as advocates and leaders in the community for change. And that means moving to change the building code in Massachusetts. But we also, and I, this reminds me, it's akin to what we did when we led the world model on uh, taking on and reversing the trends of childhood obesity started in Somerville, which shaped up Somerville, and was the first worldwide community-based environmental assistance approach to changing behavior. And because it is complex, and we don't want to drown in that complexity, but if people own the work and we simplify uh, complexity, we can move towards uh, that change. So what we want to think about is how do we... How do we get people to own the work? How do we get people to uh, collectively as a community to work to change the regulations? But we want to make, um, as we did with uh, taking on child obesity, we made the healthy choice the easy choice. It didn't come down to a choice of convenience. It'll cost me a little bit more to have solar panels versus here. And, you know, I want to, we don't want to deplete someone's ability to pay and stay in this community. So if we work collectively to think of the regulations, zoning, laws, or incentives we can create locally, if we align that with a much larger strategy, which we are with communities like Boston and Cambridge and the Metro Mayor's Coalition, to take that on at a state and regional level, we move towards making, we simplify the complexity of making the choice of shifting towards more greener, uh, homes and buildings and the requirements to make things more carbon neutral and again I'd say uh, net zero um, uh, net zero energy uh, easier and doesn't come down to a choice of, a choice of convenience because that choice of convenience usually comes down to cost uh, and I think that's how we how we move towards that it's not it's not simple uh, but it can be done we showed that we could be done and some of those we took on uh, policies around food access food security the built environment we weren't telling people how to live that you needed your child needed to lose weight or the obese we were trying to make sure that we made the healthy choice the easy choice and we wanted to incentivize a certain type of living uh, active living and we we want to incentivize our behavior and our living that, that pursues a more climate neutral uh, world, and in some of it especially. Thank you. Ms. Wallace? Thanks. So what I would like to see as a first step is pulling in the, the homeowners that li reside here and see what, the, what is their barrier. Because we need to look at their income, we need to pull them into the conversation. We can keep passing zoning or ordinances, that, and as J.T. Scott, it's enforcement that becomes a problem, but we need to engage them as part of the conversation. If they're part of the conversation and feel like they're being heard and understand, and if they understand how they can make a positive impact, then that's the first step to engagement. But we also then need to look at costs and then how we can have incentive programs, but we also need to move to the state legislature more and expect that they're going to do more. This is the time where climate is an issue. We need to act more at the legislature and engage them in a, in a large scale. And again, we need to engage as many groups as possible so that we can all have the conversation at once. And I think that that would be a great start to making homeowners a little bit more willing to convert into renewable energy. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for one more. Are there any other people? Yes? So just introduce yourself, please. Here you go. Hi, my name is Kate Murphy, and I'm with Tufts Sunrise. Um, so as you know, young people have been very involved in cl the climate justice movement, and not just Greta Thunberg, but like high schoolers, college students. I've even seen many like middle schoolers leading strikes. Um, but many of these people are unable to like make council meetings um, because they like they lack the transportation. Um, they're not old enough to vote yet. So how are you going to make sure that you're including young people's voices uh, when it comes to climate change? Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Lost, do you want to take this first? Hi. I, I think it goes back to however you include everybody is you need to be aware of their schedule and make yourself available to make them include, be included in the conversation. Whether that you bring yourself to them is, going, is a huge piece because a lot of transportation is an issue for a lot of people and getting around. So you make yourself available to their schedule and you make yourself available to go to them. Not everybody can always come to where meetings are being held, and especially recently barriers are huge in the city, so I think that would be the first step in how to engage younger people. 
Thank you for the question and thank you for your activism. And it's actually that activism too that made us back in thinking about how do we how do we strive to get every stakeholder, young and old, to own the necessary work of this adaptive challenge? We'll, we'll easily solve logistical issues and when we have meeting times and when there should be held, but who owns the work? And the work doesn't lie, and the leadership doesn't stop at who gains uh, authority via an election, you know, transactional authority or charter authority, your councilors or your mayor or your legislators, but the movement is happening because people, leaders in the community, stakeholders like yourself, like Greater Thunberg, and around the world and every city and town in this world uh, are, are fighting fighting for a world that remains in place, fighting the greatest existential threat we're facing in, in our lifetime. So how do we include you? Well, one of the ideas I put forward is to, is to form and cultivate the sum of a climate force team. And I'm not talking about three to five people. I'm talking really a large cohort of activists, young and old. You know, it's akin to what we could do in the Green Deal. Who participates not just in the, in the new climate, the green economy, but in advocating, being active, fighting for that new economy, fighting for our climate action and some of all. There's an opportunity for us to bring people in, not in just in the conversation, but to own the active work and participate hand in hand with your elected leaders and every stakeholder in the community. If we rely only on the people you elect to office, uh, you're always fighting the barrel as a bureaucracy. Uh, I have no doubt where my colleagues in elected government and some of us stand or those who represent us at the state house. But it, the change will only come if people like yourself, stakeholders around the community, if we pluck a value string with them and they understand what this threat means to us locally. And as, again, we're feeling those local impacts every day, own that work and are active with us. Thank you. I spoke too soon. We may have time for one more. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Hi. Amazing. Just introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Malcolm Cummings, a uh, Somerville resident for the last 10 years. Um, I was curious, there's been a lot of talk of incentives, and I uh, hope you could speak to how you would use your influence as the mayor to ensure that the fossil fuel industry, or how to counteract the influence of the fossil fuel industry on state and local policy, bearing in mind that there is quite a lot of uh, direct investment from Shell, BP, Saudi Aramco, any and other major oil companies in Somerville. Thank you. Mayor Curtisoni, do you want to take this first? Malcolm, thank you for the question. Well, we need to lead with the values and the voices of our community. And here's what I do as mayor and my role as Mayor Somerville, as, a, as the leader of the Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, as the regional, and really some of the national narrative on this, is to put forth that value statement. So more locally, when we're faced with a decision, we're taking on our utility companies and how they're dealing with gas leaks. We're engaging industry leaders who want to come to Somerville, invest and develop to push them towards building uh, you know, in, in developing buildings that are, cl that are carbon neutral. We're leading those more direct transactions here locally, but we're also fighting on the regional level as well. When we talk about the localization of climate impact, it doesn't stop at Somerville. The metropolitan Boston region that we sit in, which is more than 130 cities and towns, uh, and more than about 4 million people, is now the most congested region in the United States. We are also paying some of the highest energy costs. All our policy decisions here as a region, like most city regions, are driven by the fossil fuel energy. So things we need to do uh, collectively, not just in Somerville, but as a region, to advocate against that, uh, for that change. Um, I'll take the best example is the expansion of natural gas. I, I've been fighting, I've been joining citizens groups to fight for the Weymouth compressor, and we need to make sure we do not rely on great utilization of natural gas because it's also a major emitter and contributed to our, our carbon footprint, uh, and it's going to be obsolete. We cannot allow infrastructure to be put in place in any city and town to impact the region for the next 50 years. We need to fight at the same time to make sure renewables and clean energy sources like wind are cheaper and more accessible and fuel our grid, supply our grid in our transportation systems like rail. So I've been taking that lead on as mayor. We, we are setting an example in some of all. If we move forward and what we're doing in some of Climate Forward will have great success, we can set a model. If we activate, as I put forth, that the Sumble of Climate Forward team, that is another level that no other city and town across the world is doing, at least in the United States. But we need to understand that we have a regional and collective responsibility to, to, to push this narrative, not just in the Commonwealth, around the country. Uh, there are cities and towns next to us, one or two towns removed, we have no capacity to do this. Believe in the same values. 
and I just skim it along. They have no staff, but they have what we have. They have active, engaged people who understand that this is a great, it is an, it is an ex existential threat of great proportions. And taking on industry like the fossil fuel industry, changing our reliance on fossil fuels to more clean energy, energy renewables is a priority. And that's the opportunity we have to do here right now, and the mayor can do. Thank you. Ms. Wallace? So for fossil fuels, I've been very active in my union, and unions are engaging at a local level, a state level, and a national level calling for the removal of fossil fuels. So that type of adv advocacy and the ability to continue to reach out in the way that we work with people needs to continue in to remove fossil fuel from our environment. So I would continue to use those connections and strategies because it's one of the ways that we're doing now. So as part of a statewide contract, negotiation, we put the environment as part of our contract negotiations to make sure that we're being inclusive. And that work needs to continue, and I'd like to see that continue to model on in different avenues when we negotiate. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so those are all the questions we have for our mayoral candidates today. I'm going to pass the mic off to Larry to close us out. Uh, thank you guys, that was great. Uh, that was really, really helpful. Um, I just want to, uh, I guess, reiterate that we will be putting together a, um, a summary document and getting that out to everybody, which I'm freaking out about a little bit now because we have, actually haven't planned how to do that yet. But, um, but please put your name down on the list by the door if you'd like to receive a copy by email. Uh, otherwise, check digital channels. Um, we, I also want to stress that we did reach out to um, school committee members as well, so we'll, we're going to include them in the summary report, uh, although we didn't bring them uh, uh, to stage today. Um, last two things, feel free to mingle. We have the space till two, but be aware that our dedicated team of volunteers will be taking the chairs away from under you. So uh, I hope you're comfortable standing. Um, and lastly, uh, don't forget to vote on November 5. That's what this is all about. So. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you.